nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world. Three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we take another look at the films, shows, and games we fell in love with as kids and see how they stand up. This episode, I am your host, David, and I'm joined by the Screen Refresh crew, Nick D. Tim. How are you guys? The Kubite today? Express leaves in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Kumite. Kumite. Even the montage song is Kumite. Is it a chorus? Now it is. It's spe- specifically written, I think, for this movie. <laughs> It had to be. I would I mean, certainly hope so. The background, that, <laughs> the background voices. Like, or can you imagine if they're just going through stock sound effects and they're like, oh my God, you are not going to believe You're not going to believe Wait, this. I thought that was, isn't that the, the music they play at the actual Kumite, right? I mean, that's the oh, theme that, song they play. In what's the, that? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. diegetic. Yeah, all the, the all, all the people in Hong Kong are big Transformers fans and they heard uh, Stan Bush's... Um, You've got the touch. You got, uh, they just, they, they had to get him for their own theme. We won't get sued for this. No, not for this. No, no, not for this. So if anyone who doesn't know Kumite, that's not the name of the movie. In fact, the name of the movie we're reviewing today is Bloodsport, the 1988 martial arts classic. Some would call it a classic. Not really sure about that anymore. It's a classic. Um, okay. Starring Jean-Claude Van Damme or JCVD. A classic for me and my, my childhood that I saw on cable TV so, so, so many times. And occasionally on uh, VHS, probably. VHS. This was on cable um, TV. Were any of... Yeah, all the time. I think this is the perfect cable TV action movie growing up. Yeah. I feel like it's... You can turn it on at any point and be like, I know exactly what's going on in this film. <laughs> also, they cut away from anything that even borders on truly violent. <laughs> or truly progressing the plot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's hey, he's trying to not much. be in the Kumite. Not really a plot. I mean, it it kind of has it. It has like multiple plots that don't finish. It, but then there's just the one, which is I want to go to the Kumite. I got to the Kumite. <laughs> hey, we need you back in America, not at the Kumite. I don't wanna. <laughs> okay. The, the main character has a goal, which is win the Kumite. Um, he doesn't learn anything. He doesn't change, but he, you know, he, he achieves this. True. I like how he has no arc. The people around him just have to learn to be like, "Hey, you're going a wall." Okay, I guess we'll just watch the Kumite and cheer you on. It's just a movie about the acceptance of other people's dreams. <laughs> no, just one particular guy. <laughs> it was his birthday wish that year. <laughs> so I went into this blind. I had no idea. In fact, the only other Jean-Claude Van Damme movie I'd ever seen was Street Fighter. So the bar was really low. Um, and Predator. It, not all. <laughs> Wait, he was in. Almost. Which? He's in there. There's <laughs> yeah. some shots, I'm yeah. sure, that are him. <laughs> but I had no idea. So um, I'll admit the first probably 15 minutes was a little bit of a struggle to follow but he did have a goal he wanted to honor oh his bushido his, uh, it's like a his just his um his sensei his, hito his abuela <laughs> his term for his master his trainer his babushka his, uh, mentor him and then I guess right. it's just he's a rotten soldier. His sweet and like, and just in hindsight, I feel it was just this whole thing just to get that sword. But I feel like there are other ways of getting a sword. Oh, that's right. We never see him get the sword. No, he does get the sword yeah, at the end. end. He gets the sword. Oh, that's right. Oh, before he goes. So, how far into this film for anybody that didn't watch it growing up? How far in before you said this is Mortal Kombat? No, this is Street Fighter. <laughs> well, actually, it is Mortal Kombat. Uh, this is what Mortal Kombat's based on. Weird, considering how you had one guy that fought like Blanca, one guy that fought like Sagat, <laughs> one guy that fought I like I love how Ihanda. literally those are two bullet points in my notes. Is this guy Blanca? Now Sagat's <laughs> yeah. fighting. Um, but yeah, uh, the uh, the creators of, the, of uh, the original Mortal Kombat credit Bloodsport as giving them the idea. And that is why um, Johnny Cage is based on Jean-Claude Van Damme and does the crotch punch. The split cross. They borrowed, yeah, they borrowed heavily from Enter the Dragon as well. Mm, makes sense. The whole going to the island for a fight and 
Yeah. I mean, I think half of John Claude Van Gogh, also Bruce Lee, JC, JCVD's <laughs> like career is him going to an island to fight or a parking garage <laughs> or occasionally the future, I guess. <laughs> going somewhere for a fight. That's should be the title of his memoir. Yeah. Street Fighter the game came out in 87. This was 88. So Street Fighter the first one was already out by this point. Mm. Although I think that's why they named Oh, go ahead. Because was the. Well, I don't think. Was Guile in the first game or did Guile get introduced? I don't in the remember. Game? I thought the first no, one he didn't wasn't do in the that first well. Game. And that's why the second one was such a. Like they, they had to change it up so much because it's just. Yeah. It's a big departure. And then that's the one that took off. There was no Guile. They, in there the was first like one. nobody in the first one. Maybe Ryu, but it wasn't what Ryu was by the second game. So, Sagat was like the big bad. And then it was Ryu. How and far Ken was there. Yeah, seriously. Well, and so the other thing with Street Fighter is that it really, like, Street Fighter 1 did really well. You know, it was incredibly advanced compared to a lot of the other fighting games oh, at yeah, the like time. Yeah, like, even which that game were, that they were playing were, at the arcade was real, right? Wasn't that, like, Kung Fu or something? Yeah, that was of the time. And to think that Street Fighter went up against that game, it's like, oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> but, like, Street Fighter... Karate Jam. Street Fighter 2 did... It was called Karate Jam. Street Fighter Jam. 2 didn't even land super well. It wasn't until, until Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition came out that like buzz really happened and rainbow edition was like this weird almost like director's cut where they like, they really sped up the combat significantly and wow. like added in some thing like some game breaking things so street fighter 2 rainbow edition introduced combos to fighting street games. fighter 2 because it didn't feel as it's already really slow so the fact that they yeah. sped it up compared to what it was that's insane and the street fighter 2 rainbow edition is what kind of set the stage for what street fighter is now which is kind of cool they they even did a yeah. rainbow style edition for uh, street fighter 4 which they put out in like the their definitive edition of street fighter 4 in huh. which was it like ken's hurricane kicks ken parry fireballs and all sorts of wacky nonsense but <laughs> i find it interesting that this does feel like you can definitely see that this is what turned into Mortal Kombat for a lot of it. But then also, he is kind of still very Guile-esque in this mm -hmm. movie of like the, what was it, the Marine that goes AWOL. Although I guess then it's all based on the life of Frank Dukes. <laughs> oh, Frank I'm Dukes. Quoting. I, I'm air quoting. Mm -hmm. Here's where this movie goes above and beyond for me. I don't know if this has ever, maybe this has been done in other Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, but I have to appreciate that... <laughs> They gave him Belgian and or French parents. He was clearly not American. Well, I couldn't tell in like, the beginning because of the ADR like it, was so atrocious. It's um, <laughs> yeah. the the yeah, the introduction to him is a, a bit as a kid. Yeah, it, as, a, as kid. a kid is a bit and of I mean, a mess. I, um, but before, admit, well, before we get into that, though, wait. before we get into that, mm. please hold that thought. I just want to set the stage, if you will. For Bloodsport. Now, Bloodsport. Bloodsport was not a critically acclaimed film. Uh, currently, it ranks uh, with a 46% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, but it is the movie that launched Jean-Claude Van Damme's career. It was his first big film and set the stage for him to then go into, you know, Universal Soldier, uh, Lionheart. Um, the Quest. Quest, Yeah. I think this was the year before Kickboxer. It was the year before Kickboxer. Like, it really, this launched his career. He'd done basically some very small things before this. Uh, and in interviews, he was even talking that at the time when he got the Bloodsport uh, role, like, he was homeless, living in cars. He had just moved from Belgium to the United States. He was in a rough spot, and this really, like, launched his career. Hey, for when, him. Was, and although when was it, Predator hmm? in this timeline? 86. 86. So he did Predator. All right, it came out in 87. Sorry, he would have been. He would have been okay, filming so in 86. When did this come out? 88. 88. Oh, February no shit. 88. So he would have done Predator first. Yeah, because I think in the backstory to that, he was trying to like break into American movies. Which, and I think he quit because he was like, eh, this isn't going to help well, me. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, also it's a case of like, I want to break into movies by nobody ever seeing my I face. I get why he yeah. left. And, yeah. I mean, and the creature design too, at the time, I don't think would have worked. But I would have loved to see that alternate reality where that movie was made instead of the one that we currently know and love. 
I'm picturing the Predator coming out, doing a split, and rocking <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger right in the groin. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> the movie just ends. I heard you want to be a farmer. His head just explodes, his spine comes up to him. <laughs> Uh, so quickly, this did not do well. Um, I'm picturing the face from Total Recall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this did successfully launch his career. I mean, the movie only had a budget of about $2.3 million and made $50 million uh, worldwide. So huge box office success, considering what they spent on it. Um, yeah, and it was a surprise, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You know, there aren't a lot of great Western martial arts, martial arts films. Um, this still probably ranks as one of the better ones just because we're not really great at making them. And, you know, it, I mean, it didn't it didn't release against a lot. I mean, it released against like Hairspray, uh, A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon and Aloha Summer, which I mean, <laughs> I mean, Hairspray, Hairspray did well. I mean, there the are movies that did well, but like it didn't go up against like another action movie so it was like if you want to watch an action movie that weekend i guess it you, actually I guess you're so Bloodsport. it went up against action jackson the same month with carl weathers oh that was the same month a super spy action jackson He's still fighting I mean, carl weathers, so man. they had this <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah like the rest of the stuff that it was going up against wasn't even in the same like serpent in the rainbow she's having the baby unbearable lightness of being school days shoot to kill with sydney poitier uh sleep away camp too so yeah it's like other than, like, if you want an action movie, Action Jackson. If you want a martial arts movie, this is literally the only game in town. Yeah. Other than Hairspray, Frantic, <laughs> Roman Polanski's Frantic. Um, so, I mean, that might have helped it a little bit. But still, that's a, a huge success, like, financially for them. Um, which then, you know, ended up launching the Bloodsport franchise of Bloodsport 2, 3, and 4. Of which Jean-Claude Van Damme is in none of. <laughs> well... But two of them have Kumite they, they, in the sub. They did or they did not. Well, they, they did. Also, Blood Bloodsport Four: The Dark. Kumite. You know that's kind of messed up though, because <laughs> at the very end of the movie, it flat out says that he goes on to win the next like thirty six Kumites. So having Bloodsport Two with Frank <laughs> Dux in it again, it's just like, well, we already know he's gonna win 36? in a row. Oh no! I was it thirty six Kumites, or I thought it was the consecutive number of opponents beaten in a row. Regardless, uh, he had the, it was it was most number of knockouts in a tournament. Yeah, and he had fifty six. Yeah. Um, but I think he. he I I, I want to question all these real <laughs> Frank. Dukes. I think he. I think you he should. did claim to win several of the Kumites, though. He definitely like didn't end there. Um. <laughs> But yeah, we'll get in. We'll get in the Frank Dukes a little bit uh, towards the end, but uh, some some interesting it's stuff going Dukes. on. Um, but I guess that's also a good place to start. So yeah, Bloodsport, um, a Western martial arts film starring Jean Claude Van Damme, um, is based on the true story of an incredible American, apparently Frank Dukes. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, U.S. Special war Force, hero. War hero, U.S. Special Forces, uh, awarded with the Medal of Honor, fought the only Westerner to ever win the Kumite, won it several times, has the record for the fastest knockout, the fastest uh, punch speed, <laughs> the fastest kick speed. I was surprised at the uh, knockout, mo- like 3.6 seconds. Like, I'm not, I'm not an avid boxing fan, but um, growing up, my mom used to rent the pay-per-views and she would host a party a lot for any of the big, big fights, especially like any Puerto Rican fighters that are fighting. You know, she would watch them. She'd have a bunch of family come over and watch it. And I always enjoyed the energy of watching those kinds of fights and just imagining like, you know, two guys in the ring and then like the bell rings and 3.6 seconds later, the first punch is swung and the guy's knocked out. That That's amazing to me. But of course, this all yeah. because you're home, not paying for tickets. <laughs> Can you imagine if you went to like Vegas and you're like, "Yeah, let's go spend all that money," and it's just bell dings, and this guy just gets his lights turned out, and you're like, "Okay, I fun. guess uh, we'll go see the fountain." <laughs> I guess the tournament's a good a good uh, format because at least there's many more f- yeah. many more fights. Yeah, I mean, Frank Ducks supposedly. Retired in 1980 from the Kumite. It's Dukes. As, it's Dukes as the world heavyweight champ, <laughs> full contact Kumite champion, uh, winning 329 matches. 
<laughs> so evidently, so the kumite is a real thing, but not as they describe it. The kumite is a fight of endurance where they have one guy face a hundred men and see how many fights he can win back to back to back to back before he finally gives out. So he used a word. It's not any of the real things that they would have done, but that's... Tim, you mean to tell me... Luckily, the only thing we'll cast doubt on You mean on to tell episode. me a movie <laughs> embellished on a real-life thing? How dare they? That's impossible. <laughs> Movies would never do that. Does that mean he... No, he this movie... 56 dudes in a row? This movie stayed 100% true to facts as they understood them, as told to them <laughs> by Frank Dukes. <laughs> I mean, despite the fact that while Dukes did serve in the military... He was never on any sport special forces missions. He was never part of the Navy SEALs or Green Beret. He was never awarded he, a Medal of Honor. He was he never, was never in Asia. Missions. He was never in <laughs> Asia. Um, uh, yeah, evidently at him. one point the he, FBI, he, I think, investigated him for improperly wearing medals because he didn't earn those. The trophy he held up for like a photo from the supposedly winning the Kumite that trophy evidently was bought in California because a trophy maker ended up in, I think, after this came out, the news article, the trophy maker was like, yeah, I have receipts. Oh he purchased God. that here. <laughs> Nothing worse than stolen valor. <laughs> Supposedly, the sword that he wins from the Kumite, uh, he says he no longer has because he had to sell it as part of a ransom to help save Philippine orphans or something that were kidnapped. <laughs> Heart of gold, that guy. Yeah, he also has his own book where he... he he wrote a, a novel where he talks about his experience in the military and references several high-ranking officers in the military who dispute every single claim or even knowing him. It's, it almost reminds me of like <laughs> Tropic Thunder when they go through all of these steps to make this movie based on this veteran just to find out like he wasn't even in the military. And Oh, that's yeah. right. That is <laughs> yeah. exactly the plot yeah. of that. I banged a bunch more reporters too, but they didn't want to put that in the movie. <laughs> I didn't. Wa- I didn't want to put too many in. Well, so I was looking at some, um, like, behind the scenes investigative things on all of this, and I guess at one point he said like the stuff that wasn't true in the film. One of it was. Oh, yeah, like I never had that romantic interest during any of the Kumites because I was so focused on the fight that I would never have relations with a woman before uh, the Kumite. (laughs) It is impure. I loved, there was a quote about Dux's, uh, Dukes, I keep wanting to say Dux. Uh, His book, it's called The Secret Man. And there was a really great (laughs) review in Publishers Weekly. Um, and it said, it's hard to tell whether the author is merely posturing or expressing his fantasy life in a memoir that reads as if patterned on the early paperback Avenger series. <laughs> I mean, all <laughs> jokes aside, even though all of this is called into question and all of this is just bogus, I mean, you gotta give him credit for the fact that he just made this up of, yeah, that's right, I was a martial arts champion that fought in a secret battle for 365 fights, and everybody's like, Let's make a movie series around this. We don't have the internet to check them yet. I mean, I, at, the end, at the end of the day, like, I think a lot of this adds, like, some background flavor to Bloodsport and, like, some of the fun. But, like, he wrote a pretty good book. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even realize that until they got to the end. And then they do that, like, text over the credits at the end of, like, and all of this was based on real life, whatever. And I was sitting there like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> the answer is yes, Tim. Yes, they are. I was on you. Google by the time the like first text left the screen. I almost wonder if he like he if he added that tidbit because he was worried no one would buy his script. He was like, yeah, uh, but it it happened too. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he also opened his own dojo and started teaching martial arts. Um, but like appa- apparently, because he didn't just write this, he was also an advisor on set and did a lot of the fight choreography. Um, and a pain, apparently it was a huge pain in the ass. Like when they brought on Jean-Claude Van Damme for the part, uh, he notoriously said that when Jean-Claude arrived that he wasn't nearly in good enough shape. And this is Jean-Claude Van Damme coming off being like an, an actual mixed martial arts fighter. <laughs> and so Jean-Claude Van Damme really? had... Really? Oh, so they, they beefed him yeah, up? Yeah, he trained for three months um, in addition to his regular training for this film, and he said it's some—it was some of the hardest training he'd ever endured in his life. 
<laughs> all because the advisor on set was like, nah, you're not nearly what I was. Because it was probably all fictional training of just, <laughs> we have to beat you with these bamboo poles for how long? Three months. <laughs> That's what I did to win the Kumite. <laughs> I will. S- <laughs> did you learn any martial arts? No. I will say watching the entire thing, like the movie portion itself where there's dialogue that I could have fast forwarded through. I think David could have probably told me what was happening between these segments and it would have been the same emotional impact versus me watching it play by play. However, the fight scenes, I was hooked. They were extremely well done and I can absolutely see why this propelled his career. Like acting is not his forte, but he makes up for it in so many other areas. I mean, I don't think any of the choreography in this film was good. Like it, it was shot it was shot in a lot of slow mo and a lot of like very telegraphed punches. I and like kicks. seeing all of the different times you could see the guy go for a kick in the face and he was clearly no pun intended, like a foot off. You completely not even close to hitting the guy's face, and then it would cut, and then you see the guy like reel backward from the hit. Yeah, but even with that, I still think like, are they well choreographed, good fight scenes? No. Are they fun? Yeah, yeah they're still extremely fun. entertaining. Like, there's plenty they're of stuff fun. that it's like would make no sense in any real yeah. fight scene. Yeah, and I mean, the movie was produced by the Cannon Group, which was never known. Oh yeah. That's what I forgot about that. Yeah. When I saw that, I was like, oh shit, this I makes sense. I don't yeah, yeah, this movie's known, a canon event. They were never known for creating quality films. Oh. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of like cash ins on ripoffs. Um, I mean, they, they got their start doing uh, English language versions of Swedish soft porn um, and then kind of just hit like, just did like real low budget like knockoffs and nothing nothing great i mean Um, they had a chokehold i think for a while on martial arts films between all like the ninja films and i think they did jim kata and all the other ones yeah they did american ninja enter the ninja revenge of the ninja (laughs) ninja three the dominion (laughs) Mm. what's the uh and breaking they're the breaking guys yeah and breaking too electric boogaloo (laughs) boogaloo (laughs) so i you know as soon as you see the the canon logo you're like oh this is (laughs) Mm, this is going to be I mean, something, but, uh, but so like I, I the, the production quality is not there, and a lot of that falls on canon. I think I was baffled at seeing the the director involved with this, right? Because I was like, oh, so he hasn't really done anything else movie wise, and then I realized, oh, it's because all his work was as an assistant director or second unit director. Of every movie ever. Right, yeah. So the director of this is Newt Arnold, who, if you go into his filmography, you're like, oh, he hasn't really done anything. And then you start looking deeper, and he's like, oh, he was assistant director on Blade Runner, Godfather Part 2. I'm trying to think of what other ones I'm missing. A a Simple Plan, Last Action Hero, Walk in the Clouds, TMNT 2, The Abyss, War Games in the Heat of the Night, Sorcerer, The Jerk, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and Cheech and Chong's next movie. So like this is definitely a director who has experience. You got experience. Just, just not necess- got a lot of experience. Just not yeah. necessarily being the lead director. Calling the shots. Yeah. It was twenty years of hey, you want a job? Was yeah. this a passion project for him, or this is just a paycheck? <laughs> I was probably an opportunity. I'd say yeah, probably. It's probably one of his first directing creds, and he was like, just probably yeah. just jumped at it. Maybe. I was like, hell yeah. Hmm. Weird I mean, that he didn't come back for the rest of the Bloodsport films. I know. I mean, it made a bunch of money. I'm surprised that weren't they weren't like chomping at the bit to get them. Well, I know the the one of the writers for this um, either must have really liked Sean Claude or Sean Claude liked him because he did this Double Impact, Lionheart, and then directed both of those movies. So it was like just back to back to back with Sean Claude Van Damme. Because that was uh, Sheldon Lettich. Oh, I don't think I, I didn't. I do not think I realized that. Take your word for it. Yeah, yeah he's the writer of Double Impact, Rambo Three, and Lionheart, and he directed Double Impact. David, and Lionheart. you don't understand Tim hmm. deep dives. He's like the Sean Evans of like finding the, all this type of shit, and like you think you did your research? No, Tim. Tim's got you circled. <laughs> Fun fact: Did you know New Arnold had an eye patch? Just a just a thing. Just a thing. What is a what, what is Sean Evans's thing Hot in ones. his own world? 
<laughs> gotcha. He's one okay. of the best interviewers because there's like s- super like, cuts of uh, people yeah, telling yeah. him like, wow, you are an incredible interviewer. And he really does a great job because they <laughs> fact check and they do their work. The, uh, the other writer on this, Mel Friedman, is actually mostly known as an editor who did Poltergeist, The Ring 2, Dead Silence, Death Sentence, Shudder, and Breaking Bad. So, Good for him. Helped write Bloodsport, started, edited Breaking Bad. Started with Bloodsport. Who else was also surprised by Forrest Whitaker yeah. being in this film? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I remember, I remember Ghost him Dog being himself. in this film from a while I ago. I did not remember him at all. And then he shows up on screen and I'm like, wait a second. In a bit part. Yeah. Being, he, well, assuming he wasn't doing too much he was a baby. before this. Yes. Like, I, mean, I was so surprised to see him. I think also there's so many movies where you see an actor early on in their career and they really like pop compared to everything and it's like, oh, that I see that they were going to be a star. Forrest Whitaker wasn't, I think, head and shoulders above everybody else in this. It was just, hey man, I'm just doing what I have with this script and that's it. He did fine. He didn't have many lines. He was really just like, he was even a side character in his side part. Yeah, I felt he was like, it was just there to progress the plot. Because, uh, I mean, all all of his segments were just, like, almost too comedic. Mm, yeah. He was really just a snarky understudy. Yeah. <laughs> I was most surprised yeah. about Donald um, Donald Gibb being in it. Mm. I was actually really, like, when I saw him, like, oh, my God, it's him. It's fucking nerds. Ogre. Ogre. And I called him Ogre through the whole movie. <laughs> but I was, like, rooting for him. He was probably my favorite character through the movie. I... I like that he was, they didn't go the route of he was, yes, he was kind of arrogant, but like he wasn't a a dickhead. Like he was like immediately like buddy, buddy from the first time he meets Jean-Claude. He he loses to him in that game and he's like, but he's having fun. He's like, all right, you're going to be my friend now. And it was like, okay, you don't have to go through this whole thing where he's. A dick, and Did then you become best later. friends. Yeah, yep. he's like that I'm, kiss at the end was a little weird, yes. though. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a macho jerk on the bus to like the woman, and then immediately after that, it's like, oh, okay, and he's just a nice guy the rest of the time. Oh yeah, uh, I do want to back us up a little bit to, to get some some context for the listeners, readers, viewers, however you want to be referred to. They don't have a say. They don't have a say. Um, so our movie opens, and. I have to say, I kind of love the opening sequence for a lot of reasons because it was basically just them building the set. Um, we opened, <laughs> we, 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 opened <laughs> we opened to the, the Kumite arena where they're like, you have no context. Like, here's a fighting arena. And like, it's almost like a montage of them just building the set because it's kind of just like an empty area with a, a, a mat and then they're hanging signs, putting up dragon heads. And I'm like, I'm sitting there the whole time like, are they just building the freaking set? And we're watching it? They just filmed it? Just the finishing touches. The, finishing touches. the, art, the art department came in and did their job. It's like, oh guys, we got the props. Here's the dragon head. I'm going to put it on this pedestal over here. I do dig, though, that it's just between that and then it just cuts to, like, this slow-mo training montage of all of these different fighters and all of these different places that it does really feel like, oh, man, I'm in for, like, this cool, like, Street Fighter Mortal Kombat style thing from fighters around the world. Uh, Well, I almost expected to hear, like, the electronic voice in the background introducing everyone. I really appreciated how even though his world record punch may not be correct... I still feel this movie holds the record for probably fastest time to your first montage. Oh yeah, real quick. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think I think the opening scene was a montage, kind of with the putting yeah. together of yeah, the, the, the whole arena. thing is. Yeah. This is the thing, like we we montage the building the arena, and then like Tim was saying, we get our fighter introduction, except we don't learn anything about them except how what kind of inanimate object they can punch or kick. I would love for them to <laughs> actually Star- do a. Like a, a longer version or just do a more fleshed out version of Bloodsport where we actually learn about all these different fighters around the world entering this tournament. But also, I guess that is kind of just yeah. Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I was about to say, isn't that just Mortal Kombat? I want them to make Mortal Kombat. Yeah, they again. are. I just, I, it's true. I, I wish there was just like an extra half hour where it was just like you get to learn anything about one of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that guy using a monkey style? Why did that other guy slap his own chest before just getting kicked in the face? Why does by he, this guy look like E Honda, and he's even doing the same moves? <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, so yeah. So after the intro, we get that that 
immediate montage of all the fighters and everyone's like we're, we're kind of giving we're kind of it's it's an intro but it's not because it's so fast like even you know we we sort of get introduced to our main antagonist uh chong lee who is like the big bad the the record holder of the kumite at that time who even killed a man last year <laughs> I like the special that, attention. I don't know if everybody is afraid of him or excited about him throughout the entire film because it's like, okay, so you guys might have to fight him, but in some scenes you're like, oh my god, and then other scenes you're just cheering for him, and it's is he just you love to hate him kind of thing? It's real strange, and we see him in the opening. He's just like punching blocks of ice and breaking them. You cheered for Chong Lee. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's so many points where people are like clapping and cheering for Chong. Oh, I thought you meant you personally were cheering for <laughs> oh, Chong Lee. <laughs> Get him, Chong. <laughs> Do I like him? Do I not like him? I'm cheering, but uh, so after we get our montage, we get the. I, I just love this. We went montage, montage, flashback. Oh no, we not not quite yet. But so after after the montage, we get introduced to our hero, uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, aka Frank Duke. Um, who is getting? Who, who's just received his furlough? Uh, he's on the military base and he's going on vacation, as far as he knows. And he's interrupted by a young, a younger officer who <laughs> comes up to him while he's training and tells him that the captain wants to see him. He heard he's going to Hong Kong, as if the Kumite, the secret tournament, is just widely known. Everybody knows open what it secret. Is. In the American military, oh, yes, yeah. it's widely talked about. Yeah, it's exclusively. People lit kids on the street. Kobe Tay this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Secret fight. So, so f- Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. So Frank, who's worried that he's going to be detained, they're going to take away his furlough. I just like that he he's already been approved, and they're like, "Oh wait, no, I want to see you for something." And his first thought is, "Oh God, they're they're not going to let me go to the Kobe Tay. <laughs> what am I going to do? Have to run." <laughs> I mean, he was right, and, and he pulls the. I mean, the, the ingenuity of turning on the shower and then leaving, it's, it's pretty good. But my question is, was there another way out of the showers, or did he just turn on the shower and then just walk past the guy? I'm curious if it was the sound from the shower that covered his exit, or if he just created so much steam that, that the officer <laughs> could not see him walk by. Well, after the guy runs out, it tilts up and he's stuck on the ceiling of the shower uh, it was an old he tricked him i thought it was he just turned into a vapor and seeped through the <laughs> the grout <laughs> i'm gonna use this technique at the kumite <laughs> secretly a ninja movie. turns into a mist enters uh chong lee's <laughs> nostrils blows his head up <laughs> put that as white text at the end of this film <laughs> uh so yeah frank manages to escape in <laughs> the most mundane way possible and in a way that I would have loved if he was just like forgot my soap oh he forgot his soap and all of a sudden you hear the car start and he leaves <laughs> it's just Damn like a, it, a long it's just a super long scene where you hear yeah. all of the sound effects you stick but you, <laughs> it's like a Simpsons yeah, you, move you just yeah. stay with the officer as he hears all of these things happen <laughs> It's just a blank expression. You hear the car start, reacting. you hear him drive away, then all of a sudden you hear, and now at the Kumite stage, Frank Dukes. <laughs> wow, Hong Kong's really loud. Um, yeah, so Frank escapes, and I expected the next scene to be like a, probably another montage of Frank getting to the Kumite. Instead, he just he just shows up at this nice old woman's house. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? Frank, what's, what's going on? Um... So yeah, so <laughs> the Kumite takes place there. Yeah, it's this old lady. She's <laughs> clear the, the tables out of the living room. She's like, "Are you here for the Kumite?" <laughs> um, but this is, you know, Frank shows up at this house because it's the house of his master, and this is where we get our first flashback montage, which is now we're just combining genres of ways to tell stories. I mean, it's not a montage. It's it's like a. I like to think sequence. that I, mean, yeah, I was, he was, I was actually... just staring off into like a blank stare at the fireplace, whatever he was staring at. The entire time, like an hour later, he's still <laughs> the wife is just standing just there waiting. Staring. Because the wife comes out, his eyes are rolled back. They're white. He's just staring. <laughs> well, it was a flashback of him from like age thirteen to present day. <laughs> yeah, just, he thought about a lot. In that here moment. is your life, Frank Dukes. <laughs> The flashback, he's leaving the shower to hide out and go to the Kumite, and all of a sudden he's like, oh yeah, and then he snaps back. <laughs> but yeah, so in the flashback, we, we learn about Frank's Frank's past, where he was 
Kind of a, a giant fan, well, but not really. Just he, hung out. We might have had developmental issues. <laughs> he just hung out with a oh, bad right, crowd. This <laughs> hung out with a bad crowd and also had a really bad accent. <laughs> <laughs> a really bad voice dub. Well, until they until the kids started speaking, it was the three kids there, and all of them are like, "Come on, Frank, let's do it." And Frank's sitting there in like a New York Giants baseball hat and a New York Giants jacket, and I was like. Wait, so this guy becomes the muscles from Brussels, and then he speaks, and I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, like the thick, like the thickest, like, f- like I don't even know, like Dutch, French. It was it was really hard to place where that accent I mean, was from. I'm glad at least they had the forethought to do that and not just like, oh, and it's just a normal kid just doing this, and then it's supposed to. Okay, so at that point, he learned martial arts and got an accent over the years. Well, yeah, but the thing is, is like the only like issue I had with that is like, yeah, it makes sense because Jean Claude had a really thick accent still, but he's supposed to be Frank Duke's American hero, <laughs> and yet as oh, a child, a <laughs> yeah, as a child, <laughs> yeah, this thick accent. <laughs> and even but that's at one what point, I appreciate, Tanaka's though. convincing what his parents that like your son needs to be training with me, and both of his parents are like from France. Yeah, and and yet Frank Dukes is like from like. I'm trying to remember where in Canada he came from. Oh, you mean the real one? Yeah, like he's from Canada and then moved to Los Angeles. It's like, but he did that when he was seven. And like, no, unless you're could in, be French Canadian, unless you're in Quebec, like you don't really have much of an accent. <laughs> I guess that's what I appreciate because they don't hide behind his accent. Like every, in every Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, they don't talk about his Austrian parents. He's just a regular American guy <laughs> with an <laughs> accent. It's not there. Come on, Dean. <laughs> He grew up in farmland, Nebraska. <laughs> I heard you always wanted to be a that's, farmer. So that's a, I do appreciate that. Like, oh my God, his parents are French and they're obviously immigrants. I mean, yeah, uh, maybe, I did like that. Maybe Frank was was French Canadian. I, I I don't remember offhand, but maybe that's the cover for it. Ah, who knows? He could be. He could not be. Yeah. <laughs> so Frank and his friends break into this house, and he kind of tries to steal a katana but like doesn't but like he doesn't not try to steal a katana <laughs> he's just like he's just present. following his friends they book it and he's like they what made gets a mess me with is this, like, they drop the scabbard they drop the sword and then he book it like you went in there to steal the sword why aren't you just taking it with you <laughs> it's not like it's slowing you down getting back out the window. It's not, and they had a long time to flee it's not like you well. guys grabbed a couch and chose and decided against it like this is <laughs> This is easy. Like it has an attachment for your belt. Like <laughs> you can throw it out the window and follow. Um, but I do love because Frank gets left behind because he uh, feels sentimental, and I love how Tanaka and his son, um, whose name is Shingo, they come in and Shingo's a little kid. He's he, I think probably younger than JCVD at this point, and just run in and the kid just like just kicks him in the stomach just like runs up oh, and for just, like just like he's like on site yeah, just like just runs in and kicks him and like jcvd the kid jcvd just drops like potatoes like nothing had ever hit I mean, him before i, I mean shingo was probably so excited sure. to be like i can do whatever i want this guy's on our territory <laughs> and i remember when it happened <laughs> father may i kill my, my, my first reaction was just like it's like oh man that's that's messed up you just kicked that kid and i was like wait no no this is a home invasion yeah, no, that makes sense. You're the hero. <laughs> He's like, finally, I can put my training to use. I'm like, here, oh, yeah. hit me with this bamboo pole. I was like, yeah, go, Shingo. You, you mess him up. <laughs> Uppercuts his spine <laughs> clean out. <laughs> um, but yeah, but, but Tanaka, <clears throat> instead of going to the police, which, I don't know, that, that seems like a bit much, makes a deal with, with uh, Frank Dukes' parents, which is the worst deal in history, which is, I, w- I won't call the, the police on your kid, but instead, he needs to be the living punching bag for my child to train <laughs> I love the arts. way that <laughs> yeah, he even approaches him about it, too. Like, what was it? Um, you know, you create vines. What? I am t- growing my son. You grow your son. We grow together. Let him be punching bag for my son. <laughs> <laughs> well, he even literally says that, like, because uh, at one point when Dukes says, oh, you just want to beat me up, and it's, I'm not bringing you here to teach you martial arts. I'm bringing you here to train my son and use you to train my son. It's like, oh, so literally you are just a tool like anything else in this dojo. Yeah. It's like, I was like, wait, so what? So like, 
the only thing Frank got out of this was not getting arrested? Like, this feels worse. Like, I feel like if, if that went before a judge, a judge would be like, yeah, you know, kids, <laughs> you can go. <laughs> he tried to steal a katana. Did he steal it? No. Okay. Did he break anything? <laughs> no. Well, I'll try to send you to jail. Guess I didn't. Go home. It's like, He'll be fined $15 for trespassing. Yeah, it's like you didn't break anything, you didn't steal anything, and the kid knocked the wind out of you? Yeah, this seems good. Let's go. <laughs> I will make your son the greatest punching bag America has ever seen. <laughs> uh, so, so we get this montage. Go ahead, take this, a shot. The, the training montage of <laughs> Shingo and... Uh, Frank, which is basically just Shingo just beating the crap out of him for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I love, we, we get a small transition where Shingo's at school getting beat up by two kids. <laughs> and then Frank runs in and saves him. And I'm just like, Shingo, what are you training for if he, the punching bag kid, has to save you? Yeah. Also, so that means he runs in and saves the kid who continually beats him up every day. What kind of weird emotional system does Frank now have? <laughs> <laughs> it's just this conditioning. I am here to be beaten up. No, I must save my beater upper. I don't understand life outside the uh, <laughs> the pain anymore. <laughs> I know. And then suddenly they're friends. And I'm like, oh, okay. So like, not things, for long. Things, yeah, I'm like, okay, things will get better. And then like, Frank will start getting trained by the father and it'll turn around and they'll be buddies. Nope, cut directly to Shingo's dead. <laughs> well, I like how he goes in and saves him. Then Shingo's like, thank you. You and I, I think we're going to both be in the Kuvite someday. And it smash cuts to his funeral. <laughs> and I'm just like, wait, wait, what happened? Shingo's dead? And now it's and now it's John claude in, in, uh, in he's no longer a kid. I'm like, we jumped like 15 years. Shingo's dead. I, did he die in the Kumite? Was it a car crash? Like we, they they don't even say. I guess we're supposed to assume he went and died there, but they never actually say what happens. Oh, I don't know. I guess yeah, it didn't bother me too much. I, I mean, I wondered, oh, how did he die? But I'm like, yeah. it doesn't really I matter. Didn't, I didn't it think matters that he's it. dead. Uh, well, my note is, I guess he's gonna get trained. No, he's a punching bag. Frank learns martial arts. Now he's friends with his rival. Oh, his rival's dead. They're plowing through exposition. Yeah, it's uh, it's real quick. Because then we have the whole scene with Tanaka, uh, Shingo's father. And we learn, like, it's so it's just like, if it was better acted, it would be an emotional roller coaster. Because it's like, Frank saves the kid, best friends, Shingo's dead. Then we learn that this is Tanaka's second family after having lost his first family in World War II during the, the Hiroshima bombing. And then he moves to the U.S., starts a second family, and now his his new son is dead. And he's like, oh boy, this would be real sad if like he emoted as an actor. <laughs> this would be sad if we cared. Well, I think the, the thing that I was confusing is when they became friends and it was you and I, we're going to go to the Kumite together someday, and then it jump cuts to him being dead, I thought, oh, so that means... For years, they worked and trained together as friends. And then Tanaka is like, no, I'm not going to train you. It's like, oh, fine. Maybe if I don't have my son, maybe I can train you. So that means even after they became friends for years, Tanaka still wasn't training him. He was still using him as a punching bag. Yeah, cause and it, now after his son's death, he needs to convince him, like, I'm finally ready to train. Because in this scene, he's now like in his 20s and he still isn't trained at all. Because yeah. then we get the second half of the flashback montage, which is then Tanaka finally deciding to train Frank. And it's, is it because it looks more like Tanaka just manhandling him and really teaching him the splits for about like really four all months. really all Tanaka does is look at him and then Jean Claude falls down <laughs> and just beat the shit There's out like of him. Like three with shots the stick or whatever's closest to him, and it's yeah. just it's almost like. I mean, we've joked about it a couple of times, but like in Kung Pao, like we trained him wrong on purpose as a joke. Like I almost <laughs> felt like that this time because you didn't see him actually doing anything in terms of training. It's just, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. I'm going to strap you to this thing with a bunch of rope and I'm going to pull it so that it pulls all your limbs at the same exact time. Tanaka's training program seems more like BDSM than any martial <laughs> arts program. It's beating him with things, caning him, tying him to a tree, and stretching his limbs. You know, it's almost as if the person who wrote this training montage doesn't know anything <laughs> about martial arts. 
<laughs> well, I laughed because I thought like, oh, he did the thing where he tied his arms and legs and forcing him to do the splits. And then he like flexes and he lifts himself up and smashes the tree. And I think like, oh, he finally earned Tanaka's respect. And then it jump cuts to Tanaka advancing on him with a sword. And you're like, oh, guess not. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you defeated the splits. Now I will blindfold you and punch you. <laughs> And then the foreshadowing of that, it's like, man, they're paying a lot of a lot of attention to Frank training with a blindfold. I wonder if this is ever going to come up again. <laughs> well, part of his training was he's like at the kitchen table pouring tea for Tanaka and his wife. And then he has to sit down to pour his own tea. And then Tanaka tries to punch him in the face. And that was like his <laughs> final test. I, I loved how Tanaka's wife, um, who's only credited as Mrs. Tanaka, has no first name in the credits, um, is like watching Frank come to the table blindfolded and it's just like smiling, like, ah, yes, wonderful tea time. I'm just gonna sit here. I'm smiling. just gonna sit here while my husband beats the shit out of you. You know, when I was watching the first ten minutes, I was kind of busy and I was like just cleaning my room up a little bit and I was just listening and just the ADR caught me off guard because without even having to look at the screen, I already knew immediately this is not what was recorded or like this is not what was filmed <laughs> this is clearly they're in a studio they're re they're speaking over their lines and for a minute i didn't know if this was an american movie because <laughs> i thought they were dubbed there's also just in general really little dialogue yeah and i appreciate that for what this movie is i mean i you know i rag on it a little bit but i really did like it and um it's yeah. cheese ball for sure. Oh, but yeah. I was thoroughly entertained through all of the different act, like main fight sequences. And, you know, I, I definitely was paying attention to those the most. And in the second, you know, every time that Kumite finished for the day or whatever, that's when I'm like, all right, well, I'm, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> going to do something else. Do something else. Let me know when uh, he's back in the Kumite. Yeah. Uh, so after the flashback montage, uh, Frank finally goes to Hong Kong for the Kumite. Um, and meets up at the hotel, which uh, I wasn't sure, but like, did the Kumite like rent out a hotel? They did like a, a room block because like all the fighters were at the same hotel. <laughs> which, Use promo code Kumite. One thing I'm that sure. I, I kind of noticed because they mentioned it uh, that it was in like Kowloon City. Isn't that like the mega city that was eventually demolished? The walled city. Yeah. yeah so I guess it was, it was filmed demolished. there before it was demolished. Huh. Yeah, it was actually... I well, I mean, it had to have been. But. Yeah, I think it was kind of like a tenuous thing. I think at the time, people weren't really allowed there. Um, I remember and they're like, oh, but for world-renowned Frank Dukes, we'll open these <laughs> doors. Yeah, so they're at the hotel, and this is where we get introduced to The Friend the, in this, this buddy martial arts movie, I guess, uh, which is Jackson, played by Donald Gibb. Uh, and Jackson and Jean-Claude, or J Jackson and Frank... Uh, bond over a martial arts game which i don't know how like do they karate champ. yeah karate champ. do they play video games or do martial arts translate one-to-one -to, -one to video games because if that's the case i need to train martial arts more absolutely i mean david <laughs> i you mean probably would dominate donald in gibbs the, um, in the ring if you just uh, you know don the ken style <laughs> you know if i can it's like oh donald gibb just might be if terrible i can figure out how to leap across the room in a horizontal plank and just like scream psycho crusher at the same time i i think we would i think like tag team we can do pretty well <laughs> right I'll just stick my hands in gasoline and bring a lighter and just go. ha <laughs> just chucking gas at them <laughs> i'm running behind trying to light the little things on fire <laughs> has to be a tag team um, but so I they, like how the only other American guy in this movie has to have a baseball cat swelling bear the, on the, the Harley Davidson shirt. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Because we, I mean, we, he's prototypical. We do meet Jackson briefly beforehand uh, when he's hitting on a woman on a, a tour bus. I think it's a it's like a double decker open top bus, which you'd be it would be hard to not be convinced that he was a villain. <laughs> yeah, he's just a like jerk. you really think it's going to be like oh Frank stands up to him and like. Oh, respect the lady kind of thing. And it's like, nope, he just sits there and is... Huh. It was a little tough for me to see him in that role because the only other exposure I had to him was from Revenge of the Nerds. So I really wasn't sure if he was going to get typecasted again for the same role, mm -hmm. but a little more smart versus how he was in Nerds. Or if um, I was really 
curious on what they were going to do with this role. And I actually really liked how he was able, I felt he was the best actor in the movie, but that's not really saying much. <laughs> and like all jokes aside, the farther we get into this later on, I do like the relationship that he has yeah. with Frank throughout mm-hmm. this movie that I think is a yeah. little bit better than just your normal action 80s fair of yeah. the time. Yeah, it, you know, it was kind of funny. The very supportive. When I was thinking of, like, while I, was, while I was watching this, I was like, man, this feels a lot like Top Gun. <laughs> I was like, maybe it was just me having this you feeling. You know, but you're not wrong. You could be my partner in the Kumite anytime. <laughs> Bullshit. You could be mine. I mean, it just... Uh, it guys, felt, it's only one-on-one. It, it's very... Ex- a lot it, like Top Gun. It's extremely similar to Top Gun. If anything, they have the same exact formula, except instead of them flying in planes, they're doing martial arts. Yeah, like if like formula wise, like it hits a lot of the same beats. Yeah, yeah. like when the mu- Russian MIGs at the end of uh, Top Gun threw sand in <laughs> Tom Cruise's eyes, and then he had to pilot blind. Well, no, they threw the sand in Iceman's. Uh, that's why he <laughs> kept going. Out, he went out of control and couldn't get out of the way. Um, but yeah, so I, I also love that. Like we were introduced to Jackson when he's like hitting on that woman, being a jerk, and then has a complete one eighty because then he's in the hotel. And the reporter is getting hit on by the jerk, and he's like, "No, he's like, you can't, you can't talk to her like that." And I'm like, "What? What do you?" <laughs> also, I like how the reporter was just asking people around of like, "So uh, about this kumite, uh, kumite happening? Where's this kumite?" <laughs> it's like, how can you I know get the tickets? secret martial arts fight that she's just like an American reporter who happens to be in Hong Kong asking around about the kumite? It kind of. In a world prior to the it internet. It kind of bothered me a lot, too, because she's asking about it so much. Like, can you please bring me there? And he's like, no, I will not. Do you want to sleep with me tonight? Of course. Of course I'll sleep with you. Like, come on, buddy. Come on. Which he would never do in real life. Never. You would never in, uh, validate his integrity and honor. This close to the kumite. I, I do love how it seems like it's impossible for her to get to the kumite. And then she immediately <laughs> like five gets minutes in. later. Can I get there? <laughs> no, like, no one outside can ever join. I can't bring you there. Not even two minutes later. Oh, hey, you're at the Kumite. Yeah, because guys, like, we need to stop putting the Kumite as a stop on this tour bus. <laughs> because like we have the transition of like she asks these two guys about it. Oh no, we can't talk about it. We're leaving. Ask this other guy who becomes hostile, and then Jean Claude and Jackson come and save her using what I is a magic trick, honestly. <laughs> with the, I, I will take this coin out of your hand. But then he doesn't. He just replaces it with a different coin, or maybe just flips it over. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a two sided coin. Because, he didn't buy I mean, it's look. still, both situations still require him to be faster than that guy closing his hand. I get, unless it's like a heat activated coin and it like reveals a picture. <laughs> maybe oh, that would be much a trick. like the plot, it was a lie. <laughs> there is no coin. It felt like a lie. Like, so Frank goes to save this woman, and the, the guy won't let up. So he he makes a wager. He's like, all right, you're going to take this coin. If I can get it out of your hand before you close it, I get her. And if you keep the coin in your hand, you get her, which has its own problems. <laughs> um, but, but then Frank does the whole, like, oh, he closes his hand, and he snatches it. And then he's like, ha, I win. And then the guy opens his hand and realizes that he has a different coin instead of the one that... Frank put the quarter different quarter that Frank put in his hand. It was like a Hong Kong, which coin. it was or for the game. Sorry. It was for the game. Oh, that's right. For the game. So it was like a token. Yeah. Yeah. It was a token. And so like the way they shot it, it clearly looks like he didn't get it, which I guess maybe was the point, but also makes me think it was like a magic trick. Like not, not that he was fast. It was just what like, if he checks it and he does still have the coin. He's just like, Oh, huh? Sorry, lady. <laughs> Just gotta go to the kumite. <laughs> because he, like Frank's face after is like, haha, I pulled one over on him. Not that I was faster, but like I tricked him. <laughs> Frank looks surprised. <laughs> He's like, wait, how'd you get that? Then in the, his other hand is his wallet. And he's like, what? <laughs> I thought it was a distraction. He was going to drop into a split and hit the guy in the groin. <laughs> That's his one trick the entire movie. That's how he takes out every opponent. It's really every every source of conflict. <laughs> Hold this coin. What? <laughs> you got my drink wrong. What? 
But yeah, so Frank wins, so he gets to go on a date with the reporter lady who asks to uh, get into the kumite, and Frank is like, no, no, I won't, but I'll sleep with you. Mm, okay. Um, so that was a thing, I guess. <laughs> and we end up finally getting to the kumite. Uh, and, <laughs> and although everyone was invited, which I don't know how invites were sent out, that's... Uh, Apparently, everyone who was there had an invitation. I don't know why anyone invited Jackson. But <laughs> Shao Kahn shows up with a scroll. <laughs> it's like we spent no time on the invitation. Like, it, it feels very Mortal Kombat, but Mortal Kombat in the movies, like, paid a lot of time to that. In this, it's just like, give me your invitation. Oh, here it is. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, how do they get a mailing list back in 1988? Also, how do they identify like potential fighters? Like we're gonna get the yeah the best fighters in the world. Jackson, like he's just kind of big. I liked <laughs> maybe. That. I assume they don't want Americans winning, so they'll just like bite someone they think <laughs> it will was lose a job overall. <laughs> the job in uh, Chong Li. <laughs> I appreciate it on how the tournament wasn't just the same martial artists across the board. There were different styles of just combat. So it wasn't just like, I don't know any. So apologies for just me naming the same ones over and over. But like, or like Taekwondo versus Taekwondo, you know, it wasn't boring. It was like you literally had Street Fighter esque type matchups where Blanca versus Sagat. It's two radically different fighters with distinct fighting styles. Some a lot more elaborate than others, but it was cool to see that. And so during, (laughs) God, what was his name? Frank's first match, I was wondering, like, what the hell are you going to do? And then he just kind of stood there, and I was expecting him to just kind of take it like Zangief and get hit like five, six, seven times. And then just he kind of ended up doing it and just kind of like haymakering him. And then just he goes down, and that's it. Or like do some kind of wrestling type move. But what it, he ended up doing was just as good. <laughs> but I, d- Jackson grabs him, flips him upside down, jumps fifty feet into the air, and then slams back. the guy's head between his legs and uses it for the pile driver. <laughs> Chong's eyes just <laughs> bulge out. He's like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> it's like Tim, you're, you're recalling a lot of uh, Total Recall vision. <laughs> <laughs> Chong Lee's like, "Get your ass to Mars." I think that was, like, some of the magic of this movie was the mixing of the martial yeah. arts. Like, this was, like, really before UFC was a thing, where we never really saw, like, different martial arts paired up against each other. And, like, this is still pretty early in, like, Western martial arts films. So, like, yeah, if you watch Eastern, like, martial arts films, there's tons of it. But, like, in a Western-produced one, I feel like we didn't have a lot. So, like, you're watching this, and it's like, oh, man, it's, like... Muay Thai versus like monkey style which I don't know if that's actually a real thing um, or like you, you have Jackson biker gang style versus like bouncer bar bouncer bar punch style. Style. versus bar bouncer versus you, you know like like a more like a Chinese karate like it was really cool to see like the different like styles actually go up against each other when they had the more extended fight scenes versus like the like chopped up like knockout montages yeah the original name of the tournament was the mixing of martial arts, and the marketing department was not thrilled with that, so they came up with Kumite. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense. Is it, that I thought it was a mixed martial arts tournament, because it's like, some of these are martial <laughs> Early arts. Earlier you just said, you, you said the mixing of the martial arts, and I just thought that was a funny <laughs> way to put it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so... I love their guide so, that they meet. Oh, um... In this scene? Oh, I'm trying to remember what his name is. Uh, Who? Mr. Lin in room 310 wants to see you after you check in. The hell's Mr. Lin? I'm Lin. It it was after the first Kumite where, I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around, but at least in terms of relevance, the biggest thing that stands out for him, with me anyway, was how he's yelling at, he's yelling at ducks, dukes, that, you know, you can't just leave in the middle of the Kumite. Like, Dude, I thought I thought we were done for the day. Everyone was like gone at that point. Like when did when did he leave early versus everybody else? Because in my eyes, at least with the camera especially, it looked like he left at the same time as everyone. 
So how did he leave early? Yeah, right. and why is he getting yelled at Maybe for he's hazing. leaving? Wait, what part, the of, the part of the Kumite? Like, oh, you can't leave early. Yeah, the second day when he goes on his date. Yeah. Now, you see, the main quote that I remember from their handler is when they first meet him and he explains to Kumite, then warns, it's time to protect your nuts, guys. <laughs> Out of the blue, no idea where that came from, which I guess he should have told to that other guy later. <laughs> yeah, Jean Claude's terrible with giving advice too, because he tells he tells Donald Gibb, "Hey, you know, he the Chong Li is very weak in the chest. You got to make sure to go for like you know his stomach. That's his weakest point. And when he's doing one on one with Chong Li at the very end, he avoids the chest completely in the stomach. He goes for headshots for a good like the first entire half of the fight is just pure <laughs> headshots." Super- Super confused about that little knowledge tidbit. I was like, "What? When was that? Like, what? When did you see that? Like, when was that? I, I like re- well, rewound there, it." So I was there like, was a what? fight of some guy versus Chong Li, and the guy like got one punch on and his that was stomach the only reaction, and Chong Li actually like reeled yeah. from it, probably because it's like, "Oh, he trained so much with the rest of his body, but his abs aren't as yeah, good." Yeah, it's not like, and he got like winded. It's not like an Achilles heel moment where you see him buckle and he's like gasping for breath, but he gets hit a lot leading up to that point. But when he finally gets hit in the stomach for the first time, that's the first time you see him actually give a single reaction. And it's not the yeah, one. And it's not a big reaction, but the fact that he did do a reaction. It's the "if it bleeds, we can kill it" moment that Jean Claude was able to recognize. Mm. Yeah, I was expecting it was like a karate kid like sweep the leg and I was like when did this happen <laughs> light up the <laughs> eyes boys light up the eyes so when they first arrive at this kumite and he has to demonstrate how he is a disciple of Tanaka the death touch. and they ask him to prove it do you want to explain the dim mock <laughs> <laughs> I would love to try <laughs> <laughs> so they a- they ask him to demonstrate the kind of like principal move of the Tanaka family fighting style, which uh, is the death touch, which we never really saw in the training montage, except that they did some like pressure point stuff, kind of. They showed like a chart, which I assume it's like a pressure point thing. Um, and so Frank goes to demonstrate and he finds a pile of bricks <laughs> and he... He asks their handler to pick a brick, and he picks one on top. And one of the the referees who's watching this to make sure everything's verified is like, "No, pick the bottom brick." And I'm like, "Okay, so he's like gonna b- break a bunch of bricks." Um, and so he hits the bricks, and only the bottom one breaks. <laughs> and that that is that is the death touch, apparently. A technique that I thought was gonna be so signature that he would use it in all of his fights. I mean, never that, does. I think he kind of does with one punch, but it's only vaguely if you think, oh, that's kind of similar to no, how he hit the bricks. but then it doesn't work. <laughs> Is it even... Yeah, because he used it on that big guy, and I thought, like, oh, that's going to be the finishing hit. And it's like, no, that's just Is that even hit. physically possible, though? I think it is. I th- Probably I think, not. I feel like I've... I feel like I've heard, like watched like guinness to choose which brick will explode with force <laughs> yeah, wait, guys no 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 <laughs> we've been watching blood sport too I long like that we're thing. starting to be like no yeah i think that's i think these are all real I mean, things. it feels like a thing though that someone could do i mean i think the idea of dim mock is real the whole like pressure point hit thing but I don't think the targeted explosion <laughs> of energy to one point in a box it's like somebody that means you could like explode some guy's liver during the tournament. No, I think it's only bricks. <laughs> it's just a brick thing. I just like to imagine like five guys standing like all in a row in front, one in front of the other. The Jean Claude hits the first guy, and the last guy's heart explodes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other four guys walk away with a story. After he hits the brick, it pans around all the fighters. And there's a guy just made of bricks and he's sweating. <laughs> oh shit! Just sweating. <laughs> there's one fighter who's just made of bricks, and he's like, "Oh god." That was my whole that's my whole thing. I want to find this now. Let's see if this is potentially a real thing with the, the brick breaking. It's probably not. Wait, are you... <laughs> Wait, hold up. I like how... So, dear listeners, Google. As soon as I go into Google and I type in Dim Mock, I get as far as D-I-M-M-A, and it says, Dim Mock training near me? <laughs> Apparently, you can just train in it. Do you want to know? I guess, touch of death near you in Would Boston. Would you like to know more? 
Nearest training, uh, the Sunoco. Uh, yeah, the, apparently, the Black Dragon Sunoco. Apparently, the real one is like a pressure point <laughs> punch kind of thing. The f- these five, was it the five point exploding heart <laughs> technique? Fist of the North Star <laughs> from Kill Bill. <laughs> aura, 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 aura. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the first five videos that pop up are Frank Dukes demonstrates Dim Mock. Oh, that's true. Wait, you, Tim, you should just go train with him. On brick, man. No, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a real thing he can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he, he explodes the bricks and the, the judge is like, ah, oh, yes, good. You you are, you know, Tanaka did teach you. It's like, great, you're in. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and then the, the fights start from there. And I kind of wish they lingered on some of the fights more. There was a lot of montages. Yeah. I do wish we got to see the full thing for some of them. I mean, as dumb as it sounds, I wish they spent less time on the plot outside of the Kumite mm. for as little as there was. And just like, guys, we know that you don't really care about the thing with Janice the reporter. We know you don't care about the whole thing of him going AWOL. Scrap those 15 minutes and give us more backstory to these fighters. I the wanted fights. an introduction of the guy that fought like Blanca. It was just so random to see someone so animated in that entire fight sequence. Oh, the monkey style every guy, other, yeah. Yeah. And I I just keep calling, I kept calling him Blanca through the whole thing because that's just, it almost was the same style. I was expecting him to start rubbing against the fucking carpet and building up a, like static electricity and shock the guy. I, you know, it's funny, uh, Tim, you mentioned like the plot outside. We never even mentioned that he's being chased down by like two CIA operatives. <laughs> Yeah, because Forrest Whitaker and his partner are hunting him down because he went AWOL from the Marines or something. And it's like, well, no, he was, he was on furlough, on furlough <laughs> um, just because they didn't want him to take part in the Kumite. Now they want him back because you're too valuable to the United States military. Which, which I love the concept of. Sure. It's, it's like, is he like Rambo? Is like... like you know, based on a real person, kind of, and he's so valuable to the U.S. military, they're like, oh, man, he's on furlough. we got to stop him. What if he gets hurt? It's like, I don't... Uh... Which, if he's that good at his job, why are they concerned about him being the one who gets hurt in this? I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of people die. It's just a full-contact MMA event. It's not... Like, yeah. Everyone made a big deal that Chong Lee killed someone last year. The death it's is like, oh, man... Death is not encouraged. Yeah, he's obviously. like, oh, he killed someone last year. It's like, oh, that's a big deal. It's like, people don't really die in this that much. Yeah. And I, I wasn't entirely sure about that because it seemed like a lot of people die in the tournament. And well, it's tough I don't know to say, it's... too, because I thought he was killing them outright, and some of them yeah. didn't absolutely look like it. But he also, quote-unquote, killed Donald Gibb outright, and then we find out, like, oh, no, he's alive. Let's rush him to the hospital. Yeah, I mean, we get some we get some full on like Bane backbreaker yeah. like finishers, and I'm like, oh, he's he's probably dead, and I was like, no, 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 it's fine. I, <laughs> very soft very, knees, very soft knees, and like, I don't know if it's like the audio editing where they really just overused the cracking sound when someone would get knocked out, <laughs> but like, I, I assumed a lot of those people just like had their neck snap. Like, there's one fight where Chong Lee ends it, and he's like holding the guy by the neck and he has his hand up and he's like looking to the crowd for like their approval and then the guy who's already unconscious and then he just slams the palm of his hand into him i was like it's like he's dead right he like karate chops yeah, like, him he's dead right probably <laughs> raises one fist in the air licks his finger they do that camera cut away <laughs> and it makes it definitely look like that was the finishing blow yeah i thought chong lee killed everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was just his thing <laughs> So I like how there's st- which even before they get to the one of those fights, I like how he's prepping for the fights by doing splits on the two chairs in the mm-hmm. uh, hotel room, and Jackson just walks in drinking a beer and just sits down on the bed and just watches him, and he's like, "Wow, wow, he's really doing those splits." Hey man, you might want to cool it. You might want to have kids one of these days, and it's like so that training <laughs> progress is just. Him doing splits on a chair, completely meditating while Jackson drinks a beer and watches him do splits, and then they head down into their fights. <laughs> hey, you know, you better stop doing that stuff. You might want to have kids one of these days. Oh, well, that just shows the difference between I also them. Love the context. I had a very, like, Lord of the Rings, like, meets back on the menu boys moments when when uh, Jackson in the movie is like, hey, man, the, the bus to the Kumite is leaving in five. 
five minutes. And I'm like, I'm sorry, there's, there's like a bus. Like, you into, like, <laughs> the, there's, the like a, there's like a Hilton shuttle to the Kumite. <laughs> the direct <laughs> bus to the, the super secret, secret. Kumite shuttle. <laughs> Uh, I was I was just like, what is the infrastructure set up here, and how public is it? I mean, it's it's better price wise for all of them if they go as a group. <laughs> I'm just I'm like thinking back to like um, there's a comedian Pete Holmes who did a series of uh, I can't remember what it's called, but he did like mock interviews with like different people within the Street Fighter tournaments. Oh yeah. Uh, and he does a bunch of these. He recently had a new one with, like, Batman comes out where he, like, does interviews. And he does an interview with M. Bison, and Pete Holmes plays, like, the accountant for the Street Fighter tournament. <laughs> and he's like, you know, M. Bison, this would be a lot more financially sound if we had everything at a central location rather than flying all the fighters out to the different locations. <laughs> he's like, I'm thinking Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and, like, that, that's all I can think of is that, like, hey, it's a Delta hub. There's an accountant who's just, like, you know, the Kuma say, really, if we get them all at one hotel and then we can just get the Hilton shuttle bus, send them over in the morning. <laughs> well, then they have to have brand deals. So that's why they had all of those Hilton signs. Every time Chong Lee killed somebody, <laughs> like they'd a, wrap them in a Hilton It's towel. like a marathon, but you got to get sponsored by somebody first before you can participate. <laughs> So, yeah, like you were talking about, Nick, how Jackson wins his first fight against that mm-hmm. mullet man guy. But I like how he wins by brute force and then immediately antagonizes Chong Lee, who then looks genuinely confused as like, wait, why is he why is he targeting me right now? And then it's like, oh, that's right, because I'm the current champion. <laughs> but for a second, he's just like... What? He's like, what did I do? <laughs> I'm just a, why is he why does he have beef with me? I take it more as like a sign of arrogance, just like I'm genuine I'm I'm honestly confused why you're talking to me. Oh, I thought it was just genuinely like I never said boo to you, buddy. Yeah. I, I love how Chong Li in this movie is the villain, but like the only thing he ever did was compete in the Kumite. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm that sure was, he that, does have a notoriety. That was the, wrong doing. the The way that they keep taunting each other, and you know, it. I didn't take it that way at all because of just he's taunting his way through every single match. You know, he's mentally fucking with all the guys that are in the ring with them, and I don't think you get to the top in the way that he did without having that kind of like bullying and making sure that everybody knew he was the best and it wasn't mm. just through his skills, but he was going to make sure he told people that kind of thing. So I'm sure there's like that kind of resentment for him, for some of the lesser contestants and competitors. Oh yeah. I mean, it's just, I thought it was funny because there isn't like a real, like true villain. No, Frank, Frank's like you can almost like, say like the cops that are chasing him would be. Some yeah. It's villains. like Frank's, I mean, that's kind of, I guess like the quote unquote issue with the plot is that like, the there plot is one? Frank wants to go and fight in the Kumite, and then he does. It's like nobody tries to stop him. Yeah, he just. <laughs> I mean, not like not in a, a serious way. There's no like villain who's like, "Oh, I'm gonna kill you outside the ring." It's just like, no, he's just fighting people. That's this is what we got. Yeah, like a little bit of a dirty fight towards the end, but other than that, it's like it's not like a, I'm gonna hold Janice hostage if you don't fight me in the final round. It's just to turn like, this is exactly what i expected to happen in a regular mma tournament <laughs> yeah and the two guys who were actually supposed to stop him from competing just become guests by the end yeah. they're just sitting in the front row just like yeah go even frank. after enlisting like the hong kong police that frank beats up several police officers it's like <laughs> any repercussions from that no nothing just back to the kumite <laughs> uh, notoriously yeah. even tempered and uh <laughs> Hey, you know what? Very forgiving we were asking police for force. Thanks for beating us yeah. up. We'll see you at the next Kumite. <laughs> um, so, like the 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 big peak of this movie is with Jackson. So Jackson wins his first two matches. Uh, his second match, he literally just picks up the guy and throws him out of the ring. Um, <laughs> and his third match is against Chong Li, who he initially does pretty well. Like he actually knocks him down and like gets things going. Um, but then he gets a little too into his own self boasting. Oh, and, uh, I was I was screaming at the TV at this point, and lets Chong Li recover he, from I, his beating. If he was as ruthless as Chong Li, he would have he yeah. would have oh, won the yeah. fight. Which 
makes which it is like su- which is surprising so much weirder for the fact that it's like Jackson has no martial arts style. He just goes in, <laughs> manhandles Chong yeah, Lee, and only loses because he's taunting and doesn't pay attention to the fact that this guy is just about he to shall calm his way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Chong Lee, you know, ha- being given like a full minute to recover, gets up and then proceeds yeah. to dominate Jackson. Um, and what I thought was going to happen is he was going to kill him because we get this whole scene where Jackson's like passed out on the ground and Frank runs to the ringside. He's like, no, no, don't do it. And then Chung Lee. Yeah, this like, was really the Goro versus what's his name fight in uh, Mortal Kombat. Uh, Art Lean. Art Lean. Shadow kicking in heaven. Yeah, now. we get like the full <laughs> Chong Lee stops on, stomps on his head. And I'm like, oh man, Jackson's dead. It was the best expression that I've ever <laughs> seen on a person. <laughs> When he stomps on then Jackson. He, just has, he has Jackson's hand, headband in his hand, and he's like, ah. And then cut to Jackson in the hospital. <laughs> he's going to be fine. It's like, just give him a week. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the very next line. The doctor's like, yeah, I think he's going to be okay. Good thing his head's so hard. <laughs> oh, okay. It's like, oh, well, those, those stakes immediately vanished. And it's not even like he's stuck in a coma. It's like his eyes are like open. Yeah, he's like, oh, <laughs> like he like hit his head on a cabinet. This should change those bandages <laughs> if he's still bleeding out. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of been a while, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so that that becomes the pro- the the crux of the movie that now Jean Claude has to get revenge for what Chung Lee did to Jackson. His job. His job is win, <laughs> what I was originally the, here to do fight. anyway. <laughs> my whole my whole plot as a character. There's so many like songs in this movie that just run over the tops of scenes where they just let it them was play so 80s. to like their full extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like I like how then they do like the montage of these fights of then they're doing like chorus of like Kumi Te. I won't lie, that was a fucking like, bop. Every single time it came mm-hmm. on, I'm like, yes. It was pretty cool. <laughs> just, and then like there's a guy using like Adon's move set. There's just the Blanca guy. There's like some other dude. But yeah, it's I really wish they spent more time with it instead of just brushing it past during a song mm-hmm. duration. Yeah, I mean the the montage is kind of stunk that we didn't get full fights. But like we got some great we like when Jean Claude fights the I mean, he's he's referred to as the sumo fighter, but he didn't do a sumo fighting style. He was just like the really huge guy, a little chubby. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know how a sumo stands completely erect. <laughs> it's like they, they <laughs> and walks towards you. They reference him as a sumo fighter. Did nothing sumo. He was just a really big guy, which I thought was a really fun fight, and I thought was going to be cooler because Frank breaks out the death touch because he's like fighting this guy and like he. Um, the sumo guy had just beaten the monkey style fighter by like crushing him in a bear hug. And then I think he broke his back. I'm trying to remember which, if that was the correct fight. Um, And so we, yeah, we see Frank come in and it's like, Oh boy, it's going to be a tough fight. And Frank is not doing well. And then he breaks out the death punch to the gut and we're like, Oh, he's going to go down. And then he just kind of backs away and flexes and (laughs) comes back at him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause he was the one who broke monkey man's back. The guy with the monkey yeah. style. Guys, you gotta be careful. <laughs> um, so the death touch, maybe not that great, or maybe he did it wrong. I'm not really sure. But then we get, I guess, the the true death death touch, um, and John Claude's <laughs> super famous move, where he does the splits as as John Claude does, and just punches him in the groin as hard as he can. <laughs> oh, you know what? Um, he didn't even hurt his nuts because that was the. Oh death my god, touch. he did the it, death like, touch on it the dude. It passed through the, it passed through the nuts and didn't hurt them and like went straight to his heart. <laughs> he drops, does that punch. The guy looks straight up in the air. Both his eyes blow out into the ceiling. <laughs> his soul leaves his body and he gets sucked. You do in that hell. to me, I definitely will look like Arnold Schwarzenegger from Total Recall. <laughs> Frank, why did you save it for that fight? <laughs> That's definitely like a vomit inducing oh nut punch. Like I mean, for sure. What if that's what happened? He does it, he instantly gets sick on top of Frank's head. <laughs> and he and, and, and like his reaction He bow right to wasn't even as severe as I would have expected. It was like, oh ow. <laughs> I was like, no, man, you just, like, John claude is jacked. You should be on the like, mat. A, pun- a punch to the gut from him <laughs> would induce vomiting, let alone that. It's like the same reaction as showing up five minutes late to a store you wanted to go into. It's, oh. 
punches him in the nuts, looks at Jackson, is like, he said he didn't want to have kids. <laughs> the kumite ends with my line. <laughs> Uh, so that was that was a cool fight, and, and kind of like we said earlier, that was the inspiration for uh, uh, Johnny um, Johnny Cage. No, John, yeah. okay, I, I thought I was getting mixed yeah. up with like Luke Cage, and I was like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> That's the inspiration for Luke Cage. <laughs> now his famous move in Marvel. Um. <laughs> He's already indestructible. Why does he need to do this? Even Johnny Cage's uniform. Oh know. yeah, a little bit. It's just like bike shorts, <laughs> yeah. That he wears in the final fight. Um, so that was that was a good fight. We get into the finals and we get some pretty good fights. Like we get the 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 fight between Frank and I'm not sure if it's Muay Thai or kickboxing, um, where they just do the prolonged "I'm going to kick you in the ribs, then you kick me in the ribs" exchange. Oh yeah, that's where his being a punching bag for most of his training <laughs> came into. I like the uh, full circle moment with that <laughs> practice. <laughs> Frank's actually kind of into it because it takes him back. I was just like watching that fight. And I was like, Frank, you got to fight right after this. Maybe don't just purposely take it. <laughs> He's crying, but not because of the As pain. As liquefies his kidneys. <laughs> He's like, I feel so nostalgic right now. It's reminiscing. I'm going to start a podcast about this. I did. <laughs> I did like that. He it's in slow motion. Those last few kicks and. You see in the time it takes that guy to do one kick. Frank has done three and like lands on his face. I like how Chong Lee busts a guy's leg bone right uh, out of his leg during his oh, fight. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, yeah, the Spanish fighter. I about yeah. that one. I like the Spanish fighter. For some reason, he seemed cool. He was like the Sagat. Oh, kind of yeah, very I Sagat. Yeah. I like, all, I like all of the Street Fighter analogies there are in this. But, it, like, it really is. It's just like a classic, like, fight tournament movie. Like, just fits with every fighting game. Funny how he's, this is the better Street Fighter movie that he was in. Right. I do wish the guy with like the the monkey style boxing lasted longer, just because his was the most interesting yeah. to watch. And then he just gets manhandled at by the a end. sumo wrestler, not sumoing. <laughs> his Jackson I can imagine style. that fighter doing like a, uh, almost like a flash mm. kick. Yeah, because you know, everything like he's style. a charge character. <laughs> Very acrobatic. I, I, I would have loved to see like <laughs> what, what would Chong Lee have done against him? Like, unless you're like a big person who can just like pick him up and throw him. Like, what do you, how do you fight that? Yeah, like, he's pretty fast. He just, like, strikes and then backs yeah, up. It's like, Chong Lee, what, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's... Just be an awkward fight. Throw more chalk. <laughs> just throw more chalk. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that, that leads us into our final fight between Chong Lee and Frank, uh, where Frank has a, an awesome costume change. Uh, <laughs> But also uh, kind of dominates that fight for most of the time against against yeah. Strongly until the, as extremely foreshadowed in the beginning of this movie, has to fight blind because Chong Lee throws chalk in his eyes. I don't think that I don't think that Pocket was chalk. Sand. <laughs> no, Alka Seltzer. It, it, well, it was a, it, <laughs> it was, was a fiberglass. circular thing, and the way that like he didn't act like he was just blinded. He acted like he was drugged too. Hmm. I think it was meth. <laughs> Concentrated meth. meth pucks. Just threw cocaine in his eyes. And it's like, oh no. I can't my feel my face. I can't feel my just eyes. dilate. <laughs> but I think it had it, I think it had to be a drug because when he what I when you see him like kind of hide the the little pill because that's what it, it just looks like an Alka Seltzer tablet at first. Mm. And I'm like, it what did, is this? Yeah, what yeah, is right. the, like what benefit are you gonna have by taking an emergency pill? later on in the fight but all right let's see how this plays out and then you see him crush it and then he's like boom pocket sand and in the way that van damme reacts he acts like he's freaking out that whole time and it's like dude you trained half your life wrong by just getting the shit beat out of you and also getting the shit beat out of you while you were blindfolded this is literally your cup of tea yeah if anything you're going home frank (laughs) so right now because of that I would have assumed all of his, the way that he's just kind of like spacing out. And if it was an Arnold movie, this is where he would be doing like that. Ah, ah, you know, cause he's basically <laughs> mouthing like he's in extreme pain and he wasn't mm. reaching for his eyes. I think there was something like a hallucinogenic or something with that. Yeah. Cause he had his eyes like wide open and it's just, he couldn't yeah. focus and he was just looking mm. around. 
I would have loved if because of the heat of the kumite, when they put that drug down his shorts to hide it, it ends up like dissolving down there. And then all of a sudden mid fight, Chong Lee's eyes dilate. And he's just like, Ugh. <laughs> this is bad. It, it was actually his like post fight LSD. <laughs> he was just like, oh man, I'm going to win the Kumite. And then I'm just going to have a party. Save this for later. Chong Lee holds the record for the only micro dosing <laughs> champion of the Kumite. <laughs> um, so yeah. And despite, despite cheating, Frank is able to pull it out because of his blindfolded training of learning how to pour tea and catch fists <laughs> while blindfolded. Is, he daredevils his way through the rest of this. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Full on daredevil. Uh, which I, I love how, like, he had all this blindfold training, but at first when he's blinded, he's like, oh no, what do I do? It's like, Frank, that doesn't just kick in. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, Frank, like, yeah, that, that, that rang a little in, uh, well what they don't tell you is that training montage was in real time <laughs> earlier in the movie. he only has like 16 <laughs> minutes of training and that's it he did real good but you know i only caught that one punch but yeah so frank wins the tournament and he's presented with a katana which i mean why why but <laughs> I hope Frank, you could have had one years ago if you just jumped out that window. <laughs> it's like I assume there was other prizes involved or something. I, I don't know. Maybe you earn tickets for spec- each win, and then you get to spend it in the Kumite prize zone. <laughs> he chose the katana. <laughs> He's like, I always wanted one in of the these. Finger trap. It's like, dude, Tanaka's like on his bedeath bed. Just go take it. There's a uh, company called Syndicate that's relatively new. They're finally making action figures of these two. I've been wanting these for a long time. <laughs> Wait, Chong Lee and Frank Dukes? Yeah, in uh, these outfits. They're not going to be hot toys? Is it going to come with the little Alka-Seltzer thing? I could probably make oh, one of those. So they don't have detachable eyes that are like... So fun fact, in the the script, it is actually a salt pill. What? Yeah. So it's salt that he threw it in his eyes? salt. I mean, I, I mean, imagine that would sting. He's a weak ass bitch. Then that he's taking nut sure. shots all movie, and then a little <laughs> salt in his eyes is gonna make him freak out like that. Yeah, it was a salt pill. That's bullshit. I didn't know they made salt pills. Like, what is what purpose is that for? Who takes those? People. Maybe they don't yeah, make sodium? them. Chong Lee earlier in the film, the night before, was having to like sit there wetting salt and rolling it together. <laughs> he uh, he runs a small company that makes salt pills. <laughs> Oh, so this was his demonstration of, how of the Kumite. See how useful these salt pills are, guys? We're not going to go under. <laughs> these tablets have been used for many years to treat heat cramps and restore electrolytes lost through sweating. Salt tablets, also known as salt pills, aren't recommended <laughs> as much as they used to be, given that sports drinks are packed with additional electrolytes, including potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. Wait, so Chong Li was just probably popping these in his water bottle, and then he was like, I have an idea? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's weird to think... Frank is blind, but we're hydrated. That electrolytes is literally just salt, <laughs> and it's you, it's meant for you for to the retain most part, water. Yeah. yeah. Magnesium salt, yeah. And there's one more. So I like how, after he wins the sword, and he goes back to tell Jackson about how like he won and all this stuff... Like I mentioned before, I do like the relationship they have, and I do like how in an action film in 1988, for all of this fighting, they have this like non-toxic masculinity moment of Frank just being like, I won. I love you, friend. And he's like, I love you too. It's like, oh, so they can admit that. It's nice. That, that's a good point. <laughs> I was touched about the I love you part. I think that was cool. But the kiss was just like, mm, I don't know if you would be going for that. His friend almost he died. He did, but I mean, if he didn't have a concussion, probably, he didn't look the type to be the one to be like, hey, bro, I love you. I Back then, especially, no, I don't think so. So you're saying Jackson was concussed? <laughs> Among other things. <laughs> <laughs> he was just repeating I don't anything think you things understand. people said to him. Jackson, I won the Kumite. Yeah, I, I won the Kumite, <laughs> Frank. No, you, no, you didn't, Jackson. What do you mean? I beat, I beat Chung Lee. It's like no, 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 you didn't. no, you didn't. I got the sword, Jackson. Yeah, me too, Frank. I got the sword. <laughs> nope, nope. It's right here, it's right here. He's holding up his bedpan. <laughs> <laughs> no, he holds up a second sword, and he's like, "Wait, what?" Frank just slowly backs away out of the hospital. <laughs> the Hilton Sword Club. They pass him out. 
Um, but yeah, so Frank wins the Kunta, gets his sword, and he leaves and goes back home to the United States. And this this is the magic moment in the movie where we're, we are presented with the... This is all based on a true story. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in which case, it states that Frank Ducks had won the Kumite multiple times, undefeated with 358, I believe it was, uh, knockouts. He has the record for the fastest knockout, 3.2 seconds. The fastest punch for the knockout, which I don't know how you record that, which is 0.12 seconds. Uh, fast. So well, th- I like how it was like fastest punch, fastest kick, and fastest punch was like in seconds. The fastest kick was in miles <laughs> per hour, and I was like, wait a second, <laughs> like, wait, how do you clock that? Hold on, David, I'm getting the actual numbers because I oh, I, was, I, I have the I have the times, but uh, I don't have the I didn't have the actual, actual numbers. numbers, the actual numbers, but I didn't have the wins. Um, but he yeah. had like yeah, 72 mile an hour kick and most consecutive knockouts in a single tournament, which is 56. <laughs> I mean, do we all feel comfortable that collectively Screen Refresh has the same number of Kumite wins as Frank more. Dukes? I think we have more than that. <laughs> I mean, I I won with 754 uh, knockouts. I don't know about you guys. I was only in like the 300s. 329 matches, retired, undefeated as the world heavyweight full contact Kumite champion. Huh. Was full contact weird in the 80s? Because like... I mean, UFC is, I think, I full wonder, contact, right? I wonder if it was just like he selected a series of words that he tried to make sure nobody would ever be able to be like, wait a second. Also, fun fact, the screen where it holds or it shows his um, Mr. Duke still holds four world records and it has like fastest knockout. That caption holds for almost 40 seconds. Yeah, it's real long. Yeah, when I when I was it was long enough that I was able to Google it, check it, and be like, no. It's when not. I was watching the movie, I thought it froze, <laughs> and then I, I checked the time, and I was like, no, that's still counting. All right, <laughs> just gonna pad this movie out a little bit before. And that's also when we learn about Frank Duke, uh, Duke's opening up his ninjutsu school, which I guess during all the claims that Duke's he Ryu. was a fake, um, part of his response was. That it's not that he's a fake, it's people are trying to call him into question so that other ninja trainers and rivals, such as Stephen Hayes, if I think it was like Ohio or something, a rival ninja teacher, um, is trying to discredit him so he can get more students. I would love if it was like a mini series on Netflix of all of these petty local ninja trainers that are just all fighting each other with all these fake things. I mean, Tim, if that was the real thing, I would I would totally I, mean, uh, I would totally Kai. sign up for one of those gyms. Like if it was like we're fighting we're fighting the du- the uh, Duke's Ryu gym tomorrow night and I'm like, Oh, I'm I'm where let's go. <laughs> this sounds like it this sounds like an alternate reality that's a blast. Hey, I've never done martial arts, but hell, neither have they. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we've learned anything from Jackson, just be big. Be big, have a you lot know, of there's heart. something similar going on in the video game world with something like that where in regular show, you know, what's his name? Garrett Bobby Ferguson or whatever, the big head. Yeah. He's based on a real person named Billy Mitchell. And he is the yep. world record holder for Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, and a couple of other, like, the old vintage arcade ones. And recently it was uncovered that the guy lied. Oh. And he's fighting like hell to, um, like, appeal it and prove that he actually is the true record holder. But people are just tearing down his like proof with a lot of different like researched videos showing that like you're clearly cheating here just give it up and stop it Hmm. but it almost has the same vibe of people trying to take down frank dukes because of just his outlandish claims like oh yeah absolutely this is exactly what happened and i am absolutely a 329 match (laughs) undefeated champion it's like all right man sure all right there's just two you must there's, not have any friends because nobody comes to right. corroborate the There's just too many compounding parables. Like, if he was, like, I was going to say, if he was, if he just said he was this Kumite you know, world champion, I'd be like, okay, maybe. But no, not even that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, like, the fact that he's, like, he was also, like, you know, and, I, and I'm, you know, military special forces. I have a medal of honor. And it's like, no, you don't. Like they, there's a record of that. People yeah, have to real. give that out. Well, no, David, they, it, it was really top secret. 
his involvement with the military it's just if you knew even anything about that we would have we would have to kill you and i'm just saying like what's more likely that there is a mediocre martial arts fantasy writer or rambo is a real person rambo is a real person <laughs> i would love to believe rambo is a real person <laughs> You didn't draw first blood. <laughs> first blood, draw me? What? Oh, wait, no, that's different. Hey, <laughs> at some point, we should talk first blood, because that's, I feel like Rambo over the years has become this, like, joke of a thing, and then you watch first blood, and you're like, first blood is nothing like the rest no. of the Rambo films. Mm-hmm. This is not actually, like, I a military seen, drama. I haven't seen any I of do them. Know, oh, first I do so know good. that the first one actually has, like, a message to be said about the movie, and then all yeah. the rest of them... It's about the mistreatment of our soldiers once they return home and they don't have a place is it really yeah because the whole thing is he comes back from the war and is just kind of a transient just like working town to town and because they don't like him being in their town they kind of hassle him and give him a hard time and the cops like go after him until they end up causing problems that he ends up like escaping and then he accidentally ends up killing one because they're trying to kill him And then they call in more police and they call in the military of, hey, this guy's killing cops. And he's like, I didn't draw first blood. You did. So, like, this is not me. Like, I was just trying to live peacefully. That's crazy. Just to find out that they turn that whole character and story into just generic action. Yeah. Yeah. That's what what happens when you have a great concept for a movie and it makes enough money that people want a sequel. (laughs) I mean, Rocky 1 compared to Rocky 5. Mm-hmm. Surprised, I'm surprised there wasn't Cobra 2. Hey, I would watch that. <laughs> Crime is the disease. He's the cure. <laughs> oh, fun fact. The Sagat guy um, plays the villain in Kickboxer. He's like the big bad kickboxer. Yeah, I think he's actually a friend of Sean claude Van Damme that they both started together in Hollywood or something. Where they like both moved together. Oh, yeah. He's, he's Belgian noticed, Moroccan. Um, yeah. So they probably the actor met in that played Chong Lee also um, rejoined Van Damme in a future movie as well. Bolo, Bolo Young. Young or Young, yeah, I he's think, in a did ton he actually of play? Him, oh, I bet, yeah. Did he play himself in the Hot Shots two scene in the beginning of the movie when Charlie Sheen is fighting in the Kumite? No, I don't. He's not in that. Oh, okay. no. Yeah, I mean that was my only experience with Bloodsport until this film. Yeah, Bolo Young is has done a ton, a ton of like Eastern martial arts films. So, like, he really brings a lot of, like, credibility to the movie. I loved him in this. I think he, like, did so many great reactions as a villain of just, like, mugging to the camera in this Mm -hmm. that I would love to see him as a hero in a movie. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I mean, he might be, like, kind of typecasted as a villain. But, like, I know he he was also in, like, Enter the Dragon. He reappears in Double Impact trying to think of what else he was in but um he plays bolo in a movie called bolo <laughs> oh he is isn't he <laughs> did he get a spin-off mm-hmm. did we not know about the spin-off movie um, <laughs> yeah it's uh two convicts get freed from prison and become lawmen in a corrupt village i think actually he plays one of the heroes in this gotta go on a a bow young yeah if they become a lawman movie marathon now I'm going to fall down a bolo rabbit hole. So many movies. God, take you forever. But so, you know, I, I, I will admit Bloodsport was my pick for a movie. I remember it really, really fondly uh, in my younger years. But on rewatch, how was it for you guys? Um, if you guys want to give it a rating, maybe a one through five on, on what you think on rewatch. How 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 well does this movie hold up for you? Maybe on a, a even a rating of one to five Bloodsports or Kumites. <laughs> uh <laughs> Purely subjectively, I will say this is a uh, four out of five for me. It's still, I think, it doesn't assume that it is anything more than it is. Like, they kind of know with that plot and what's going on. They don't spend a lot of time fleshing out any of the characters. It's just, nope, you're here to watch the Kumite, and that's it. Um so I think it's a really fun, cheesy martial arts film that has a lot of things that got used again later. I think subjectively, it's still... it's a. Th- I like how we're all I very careful this movie. to say subjectively before <laughs> all of our things. I'm, I was going to say even subjectively and with how much I want these action figures and how much I think Chong Li and Frank Dukes are cool 
Um, I would give it a... Th- I'm balancing subjective with objective, and I'm going to say three out of five. Because um, I still... I think the... The rose tint is stronger than actually going back and mm-hmm. watching it. And I guess the the cool fighting and the cool moments uh, is what stands out. Um, just the epic, the slow motion, just like just Frank winning the tournament is cool. And Chong Lee being this jerk that's also good at fighting is cool. Um, but the movie's, it's not, it's not a great <laughs> movie. It's not a great movie. Um, but it, it's fun and it does... The nostalgia edges it up to three out of five for me. Objectively, I was trying to go along with this, but I guess I pulled the Casanova bit right now. Um, Casanova? Turtles. Oh. Um, Casanova? Wait, what? What? Leonardo, Raphael, oh, Michelangelo, Chevy Nova. Casanova, all five turtles. Um, I agree with Dean. All the good ones He to um, basically said a lot of how I was thinking of it, except without the rose-tinted glasses. I've never seen this before. I've never... Um, I don't really watch a lot of action movies in this kind of caliber. I have seen quite a bit, but it's actually not my forte. Like John Wick, I really had no interest in seeing it. I don't hate them. I just it's not my kind of like go-to. So a lot of um movies growing up especially that have like martial arts and stuff in it, like Jackie Chan movies, I think I've only seen like I think his only foreign movie um, at least compared to the U.S. anyway, that I had seen is like, who am I? And that's it. But I haven't oh, seen... We, like, we have see to do a marathon of, yeah. of some Jackie Chan's. There's there's a lot. Police and I know they're yeah. great, but it just it never really kind of struck with me. Even though I enjoy them once I am watching them, I just don't actually seek them out. Seeing this, you know, it, it's not a good movie. It's really not. But because of the way that the fights are entertaining, it did have me hooked once I sat and really was getting into it. And like the first Kumite, especially, it's like, wow, this is really cool. How the whole lore thing is set up around the fight, seeing some of the fights play out. Yeah, I would give it um, maybe not. Well, now in hindsight, I originally was going to give it a four, but now that I'm thinking about it, and it is kind of. Maybe a little too high for this. So maybe I, I want to say, Dean, what did you say? Three and a half? I just right, I'm going to give it a 3.1. <laughs> Only because of price that. of writing this? <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, um, it's it's so tough. Um, growing up when I first watched this, I, I was hard into martial arts movies. Like I watched everything with Jackie Chan. I loved Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, I was just so drawn to martial arts movies. I thought they were like the coolest thing ever uh, and really started seeking them out. And it's so funny, like when I watch this movie now, I didn't even remember the story. Like nothing, like when I was watching the movie, I was like, who are these people? Like, what is this about? Like all I remembered was the Kumite and the fight scenes and like the, the those certain parts. And like rewatching it, like those to me held up so well that like it's true like the story parts and the acting is not great but the fight scenes the fight scenes are good for what they are absolutely um i i think i'm gonna go with tim on this and keep it at a four with like i guess the caveat that this is an amazing turn it on in the background movie yep like you're like doing something throw it on the background and you just kept catch bits and pieces of fight scenes absolutely amazing this is a well, like, great movie for like second monitor content yeah like we've mentioned it in the past is like it's the movie growing up of we watched our cartoons for saturday morning we went out we played with friends now we're kind of tired it's three o'clock it's not quite time for dinner but i'm gonna come in and on like channel 11 the wb or something they're gonna be playing the afternoon movie during the summer this is what's gonna be playing i'll sit down and watch it sure great cool and then you go on to whatever your next thing is for the rest of the evening um it's perfectly acceptable action fair yeah absolutely yes i would agree with that well gentlemen thank you again for coming along for the adventure on Bloodsport. uh as always you can find us on twitter facebook instagram at screen refresh or email us uh, your own movie memories at screen refresh at gmail.com if you like the show help us out and leave a rating slash review on itunes spotify or wherever you get your podcasts to help others find us for dean nick and tim i'm david and we'll see you again in a couple weeks with rule of thirds
John Claude was definitely, for the record, going to kill Chong Lee if he didn't tap out. He was ready to break his neck. I think neck. that's in the director's cut where he just kills him outright. He just he's like kills pulls, everybody. He just pulls a knife out of his belt and he just goes for it. <laughs> No! He just start, he just takes salt out of his <laughs> pants, starts pouring salt onto Chong. Everyone Lee. just makes it so much salt. He starts like his face all dries just, out, his eyes suck into his skull. Just a tight circle around him as everyone quieter and quieter chants <laughs> Kumite. And you realize, yeah, Shang Tsung, they got that from here too. 